Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week I'm joined by cinematographer Simon Dennis, whose work includes Peaky Blinders, Ratched, and American Crime Story, and more recently, Candy. Welcome to the show, Simon. Oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I guess my first question, you know, like watching Candy, uh, it has that sort of golden look to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, What was your process? Like, how did you what were the discussions with the creative team to sort of come up with the look for candy? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, it was, uh, it was any, anything I do that starts, that's uh, based on a true event, which this story was, <clears throat> I always start from the inside out with the filmmakers and the production designer and costume designer. So in this case, it was a lot of um, archive material. And then of course, you know, crime scene photographs and the crime scene photographs, Strangely, you know, that you have to sort of see them in, in, to process the story, if you know what I mean. It's, mm-hmm. it's They're very gruesome. But what, what inspired me in a strange way was the sort of uh, the film stock processes were of those crime scene photographs, which were quite sort of saturated. And that led me to do research on that period. And it led me to William Eagleston's work, which I've always loved, but it also felt apt. And he, he does a thing called Kodachrome dye process, dye transfer, uh, which if anyone knows his work, you'll know it's incredibly um, expressive in the color, particularly mm-hmm. reds. And uh, there were certain photographs of his also that had a sort of cold, a kind of golden edge to them. Uh, and of course, this is a Texas show. So Texas is naturally, in my mind's eye, got a, a kind of hue to it. <laughs> uh, albeit, you know, maybe bastardized through television or movies that you will see. I mean, I've been to Texas and yeah, it is kind of warm. But uh, uh, in this case, when I actually read the script as well, the, the, the kind of yellow leapt out of me. I, it's just conscious thing. But um, so that kind of, that was the process. It, it sort of came from the inside out and then you know through William Eagleson's work how do you because you you said you looked at the crime scene photos mm. how do you I guess process that because that's a heavy thing to to look at it is it is heavy yeah I mean I did it we did it for um the assassinate journey for Saatchi mm-hmm. um I feel like if you're gonna if you're gonna um adapt a, a true story I think you need to be respectful to the people involved and uh, particularly in this case, Betty Gore. Um, I mean, I, I love true crime. I, I mean, I've been fascinated with um, not that this is a serial killer film, but I just love profiling and anything to do with that. So it, it they are gruesome, but you have to sort of go through that process to, to kind of honor the story and, and, you know, people involved. Where, I guess, I guess that brings up the question, like, where is the line for you? Or I guess it would also be with the director, but where's the line of creativity where you can take liberty with the, the look or the history of what's actually happened versus, you know, staying realistic and true to what yeah, was? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, we wrestle with this a lot in everything we do. I think, you know, obviously there's no line when it comes to fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you, you sort of, I think on this kind of show, a lot of things are drawn on parameters of, of the culture of the time. You know, this is 1980 predominantly. Um, and so you draw a lot from, you know, the, the, that period, you know, research. Um, Jamie McCall, the designer, did a ton of mood boards like she always does on every show. We've worked together twice now. And, uh, that was a good inspiration for her research for, you know, certain sectors of the story, certain key locations, you know, airports, uh, houses, um, just, and and a lot of it, like I said, we all pretty much go from the inside out. We don't really step back and say, well, I think this show should be like back to the future. You know, you you kind of, whatever it is, although I will get onto a, a very 
a strange reference that I eventually got to in a minute, but uh, it, it, it's predominantly logic based, you know, and research based. And you sort of parameters are drawn. You, you're kind of sketching um, the style of the show based on what was around at that time. And, and of course, the, you know, it, it's funny because in the late 80s is very different than 1980 culturally speaking. I mean, people I speak to, they say 1980 is practically the end of the 70s. You, you can pretty much say that from a culture point of view and uh, technology even, uh, but when you get to like 85, 86, you're talking about a very different period. So this one was um, fascinating. You, you might have noticed, you know, to me, the, the, the outfits and the costumes uh, that the characters are wearing were kind of quite um, heightened in a way. Mm. Um, which led me strangely when I was sort of putting all this together with William Eagleson's work and also Jamie's mood boards and the research and I was seeing of that period was uh, Napoleon Dynamite, which is a very strange reference, but mm -hmm. it, it kind of led also on to how we presented the show from a aspect ratio as well. I really wanted, I kind of saw the show when I was reading it as well as being a little bit more like portrait based, almost like a, a Polaroid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, we went to the studio and pitched one three three aspect ratio. If anyone knows, which is basically a square, uh, they they felt that we weren't quite ready to do that on on uh, streaming television, and it is a choice for sure. Mm -hmm. So we came back and we uh, we settled on one six six, which is as kind of boxy as we go. And we, we knew that the show didn't need a, a ton of camera movement. It was much more about a very I call it like a cubist approach. Mm -hmm. So it was. Um, any, any of the angles feel almost like eye level straight up as straight on as we can go where we can um and you know using wide shots in the show that almost uh kind of help guide the audience in um piecing together the the actual crime itself mm -hmm. you know architect architecturally speaking you know now was this shot on film or digital oh thank you for asking <laughs> it was digital okay but, uh, we we uh, Panavision. Uh, I worked with Panavision many times now, and Dan Sasaki, if, if anyone knows, is a, a lens wizard. So we uh, we used a Sony Venice camera, and I used uh, Panaspeed lenses. Um, but this time I've used them before, but this time um, Dan detuned them because I came to, I came to Dan and I showed him the reference material from William William Muggleston's work, which is a lot of <laughs> deep texture to them, you know, obviously that's film. So we were trying to simulate that kind of organic texture. And I sort of sent him the reference stills and also sent him a, a reference to a, like a vinyl record. Mm -hmm. I kind of felt like, and records are re referenced in that show. So, <clears throat> um, so he came back and after doing some tests and he detuned them and it just looked amazing. It was a, it kind of sandpapers the image a little bit, you know, takes mm -hmm. the edge off it. So when you say detune, though, like, what's, what's he doing? Oh, wow. Well, nobody knows what he does. He, oh, he's, okay. <laughs> he's a lens wizard. And, and uh, I always say that um, after he gets the lenses back, he retunes them and destroys the paperwork. It's, it's, he's, like a, he's like a wizard. So or, I don't really, you know, find out exactly what he's done. But uh, all I know is I describe in percentages how much I need, and he does it. And... You know, but thanks for asking to do a shot on film because we also underexpose, we underexpose the um, the camera mm -hmm. uh, a fair bunch too, just to get um, a kind of richness because everything I was referencing from William's work down to the, like Polaroids of that period have a really good deep texture to them. Yeah, well, and that's that's why I was asking because I was like, a lot of stuff shot digitally, but it has this film <laughs> feel to it. So I'm like, yeah. We, well, we also did a little trick. We put a we put a print stock effect on mm. at the end in the online. So it's very very subtle, but it's uh, it, it it sort of gives you another little. Uh, I never use like the word noise because that's associated with digital, but it's it's a sort of a, a grain that yeah. Um, you know, Greg Frazier, you know, famously is now doing an amazing thing where he will shoot his movie, he'll put, he'll scan it to film and then scan back to digital. So you get that kind of filmic texture. Yeah. The bubbling through. Interesting. That seems like um, a lot of work considering that you were able to, to get it to look. Yeah. Like film. 
Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's a process. It's, yeah. You got to, it's this process now. You have to like push it a little bit further with digital because I'm not a fan of very clean imagery. Mm-hmm. I've never have been, I've, even if I'm doing a project that um, I'm going to say like maybe deserves it, I don't think, I think everything deserves a good filmic image, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, a comedy or in this case, a, um, an, an axe wielding murder. <laughs> Do you think that comes like that idea that, I don't want to call it dirtying up the image, but like, do you think that comes from the fact that we grew up with like lower quality, like you watch television and it, mm. like I go back and watch television shows from when I was a kid and I'm like, that's, that looks a little rough now, <laughs> you know, because it's, yeah. you're not used to your yeah. the, the dirty and, look anymore. Right. And um, I mean, I always still remember the, I mean, remind myself the fact that whenever you go to the cinema, back when it was projected on film, have been shot on film. Mm-hmm. Here's the sort of strange thing about film. It's, I'm not putting it down, but you know, it's, it's my passion, but, and everyone's passion if they love cinema, but it, it's, it was never perfect, mm-hmm. you know? Film print was never perfect. And so why, I think now that we live in a very perfectly presented world, you know? Yeah. So you have to sort of screw with things a little bit to get them to where you want to be. I think particularly on a show like this where um, it's set in 80, yeah. you know, I did the show before that, which was Impeachment, which was 97. And that was, um, we sort of did the same process, but it's, it's a different time period. So um, you go for a slightly different nuanced image. Yeah. That one technically was a little bit cleaner, albeit we still underexposed. So um, but I, I, each to their own, you know, every yeah. DP has got their process, but I, I, I just love a good thick neg as it were. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's funny too. Cause I remember watching at theaters and if something happened to the film at the theater, they would just splice it back together. <laughs> so yeah, you would see every right. so often you would see this like really scratchy part and then all of a sudden it would be back to normal. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And so, whereas now it's coming from a digital drive and being projected right. for us. Yeah. Yep. It's, do you think we lose something in this perfection that everyone's searching for? Because it, it seems like mm. we're, you know, like I think about, like I, I just rewatched MASH yeah. and there are shots that are out of focus. <laughs> you yeah. know, and they were just like, yeah. well, that's our shot. Mm-hmm. We didn't use it. Whereas now we would go reshoot it or we would, you know, like there would be a lot of. Yeah. I mean, I think it's supply and demand, really. I mean, I mm. think uh, it's it's also the way that uh, filmmaking evolves naturally to a, you know, I feel it's kind of strange if you think back to the days when they when film was invented. It, you know, it was just the next stage of, you know, yeah. um, art, you know, we used to draw pictures on cave walls, and now we, mm-hmm. you know, we've got cinemas, and now we've got streaming. So it's just a natural thing of evolution. I you can't fight it. Uh, all I can do as an individual is try to do my best to sort of um, try to keep keep a, uh, a sense of richness if you can. I mean, my heroes are people like Gordon Willis and Owen mm-hmm. Reutzman and more recently, Harris Savides and, uh, you know, these people were... And I'm not saying that a lot of things out there aren't in any way um, simulating film Mm-hmm. Or, or keeping that kind of the magic going, but uh, there is tons of it, and there's amazing, amazing talent out there. It's just uh, you know, I my tastes are a little bit more like um, particular, I guess. Well, thinking of like, because I think of about Gordon Willis and like all those guys you mentioned, and mm-hmm. it's really they play with shadows and light a lot. Mm-hmm. And there's like a couple shots, like there's a shot with the light cutting through while well, they're sitting on couches at one point, that's really interesting to me. Mm. Um, I can't remember what episodes in, but like, how do you, I guess, how do you talk to a director or a producer to convince them that we need to go like, don't worry about it being dark here. Let's get mm. some shadows in here. Let's get this looking like a piece of art as opposed to just a, you know, photograph that I took on a disposable camera. Right. I've never really had any issues in the sense of um, uh, getting my ideas across. You know, I think er, you know, we. I mean, t- your early question about you know films and now streaming and stuff. I think 
the amazing thing where we are right now is um, opposed to like a few years ago. I mean, when I did Peaky Blinders, mm-hmm. <clears throat> that that was a show that was, that was basically based upon the Godfather and wild, you know, Westerns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we never had any interference, albeit we were doing the second season. So they just wanted more of it. And I knew at that point there was a massive creative turning point where uh, the audiences were very hungry. If you, and eventually now we're in a world where we've got very cinematic television. And I think it's mm-hmm. also very, very welcomed, I think, in, in, in home, people's um, homes. Um, the line that you draw about how dark you go, mm-hmm. I think there's no issues with brightness <laughs> with any, <laughs> any part of any storytelling. But it, to me, it's about, um, it's, it's this sort of knack of uh, not making it um, muddy, uh, but mm-hmm. making it moody. Uh, and moody is a subjective experience. And you, as long as you've got some kind of light source in the frame, um, then it, it, you're not necessarily conveying uh, darkness you're just telling a part of that story you know it's it's, it's required uh, and I think people still get this is why I think there's so many cinematographers now and, and actors coming from movies into television or streaming or home movies or whatever you want to call it now mm-hmm. uh, because they're excited by um, by the process that we can kind of we, we're, we're kind of the shackles have been taken off as it were to a degree you know obviously you can't go too extreme but um you know, I, I, I mm-hmm. kind of, I think it's a very exciting time. We should almost make a t-shirt that says, don't make it muddy, make it mu- moody. And yeah, the name yeah, of yeah. Muddy, <laughs> moody, not muddy. Yeah. 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 And, and that's also leading to that, you know, you know, these fast cameras where you can shoot in, you can literally now shoot in candlelight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's to me, um, one example of how I don't work is that, yes, I would like candlelight, but then I would supplement. It's just that you can't, that to me, you have to kind of craft, you have to carve, yeah. carve, 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 no matter what you do. I mean, you can go out and shoot an available light at night in street light, but that doesn't mean you're telling that part of the story. You need to ideally make, uh, you know, like I said, shape, shape things and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and create a character, create a character and a look that is um, in honor of the story. Now, how do you, uh, you know, like I, I think about, you've had a relationship with Ryan Murphy for quite a while. Mm. So how did that relationship come about and how'd you get involved with his team? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's the short story is uh, I'd done a movie in Winnipeg uh, with a, an American director. And I feel like there was a tenuous link looking back. There was a tenuous link between this director and a cinematographer that was working for Ryan at the time. And um, the cinematographer, messaged me on Facebook, I'm guessing Peaky Blinders was a factor too, <clears throat> saying that they were doing the Versace story and uh, it wasn't even like a come and do an interview. It was like, do you want to come and shoot a Ryan Murphy show, which was okay. to this day, very, very surreal. Uh, <laughs> and I'm kind of here because of, um, because of that circumstance. And yeah, it, it, and three weeks later I was in Fox studio shooting Ryan's show Versace. It was the strangest thing, but uh, no, uh, that's that seems like it a- pays off, I guess. I mean, listen, I, I, I you know, every DP yeah. will relate to this. I've slept on many couches. <laughs> you know, it's it's it, I, I, you know, at some point, I felt the back would break, and um, I work I work incredibly hard. Yeah, I'm hundred percent. You know, on yeah. every project I get involved with, like every DP, I guess. But uh, you just get luck does does factor greatly there. Well, that seems like a really quick turnaround, three weeks to get ready. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, yeah, I mean, they processed my visa and <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was, um, it was, it was zany. I mean, I, I, I kind of said to the cinematographer, Nelson, who was messaging me, I said, look, I'm not going to talk myself out of this, but there's so many DPs in LA right now that you could, that Ryan and you can pick. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they were insistent. They were like, no, 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 you, we want you to come through. But in terms of so getting... a big gamble, because I've never yeah. met these people. It's yeah. all through, you know. Well, and the industry is so based on your ability to sit with someone for hours on end. And, right, you know, yeah. You know. I mean, I'd understand if I'd been to the right party at the right time, you know, met the right person, but I don't I don't kind of do that. And so it's not. It's it's a lovely feeling to know that there are kind of really... Uh, genuine 
um, giving people out there that are willing to take a risk on somebody they've never met. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and the Versace one uh, is a great, that, that's like the one, that and the impeachment mm-hmm. crime story are, are both fantastic in terms of yeah. just the stories, right? They're so interesting in the way yeah. they've been told. Yeah. But it seems like three weeks, like what I was trying to get at there was like, to prepare yourself for the shoot in terms of like getting the look, getting everything ready seems. Well, yeah, no, the, well, what, what was happening was that um, Nelson and Ryan had, were already up and running. So they'd already mm. started shooting his pilot. So it was a, a case of me te- being handed the baton and they'd already had, the, the stages were built, the stages were lit and everything's ready. So I was literally just, I was dropped into Fox Studios on a Friday and I, came on the Monday and effectively oh, did, a, did a little bit of prep, of course, but uh, I, I came in what was already set up, mm. but that didn't mean that, you know, Nelson said to me that he said, just do, do you, you know, if you want to change things, you can, you know, so I just, but in that case, I was a, I was a, um, I was a guest to America. So I, I felt like I should just put my head down, work hard and honor the story really. I mean, mm-hmm. everything was so in place. I'm so ready to go. Um, and like you said, they're just an amazing story. They're very compelling. And um, as everyone knows, Ryan's shows are incredibly expressive and so well designed and down to um, hair and makeup and costumes. It's just, I, I always call them the three-dimensional environments. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you get like two dimensions in your set to work with. He got everything that we work with in his sets are all encompassing you know so in, in a strange way his his projects are actually very easy to photograph because you're there's so much to um put in the frame in any direction you know it's really hard to screw it up now i have a ridiculous question that Go. i'm sure <laughs> is going to be like laughed at by viewers but when i was studying film back in the 90s mm-hmm. i will never forget there was some cinematographer forget his name, but, <laughs> but he, he said to our class, um, oh yeah, there's a difference between the way they shoot in Europe and the way we shoot in Hollywood. In Europe, it's the right light for the right scene. Whereas in Hollywood is give me the biggest light and we'll cut it down. <laughs> do you yeah. think, A, do you think that's true? And B, mm. if not, how do you think it's changed or do you think? Uh, well, actually it, it, that probably leads me to the one quote that I carry on my head, which um, is, I think it was Gordon Willis said this. He said, there's great lighting, there's bad lighting, and there's the right lighting. Mm. And I, I think that, that that piece of adv- that quote itself as an advice just really makes you focus on what you're doing. I do agree. I mean, I, obviously, like American, I mean, I grew up in American cinema, you know, yeah. as well as European cinema. I, I, I you know, I loved <clears throat> American cinema just from a... Um, Sort of a, from a bombastic point of view, it was it was so extreme in places. Mm-hmm. That, you, know, it, it, you know, it never always felt like reality. But then culturally, I felt like America was that reality. You know, if I was watching an American movie with it. But you know, when I came through, and like a lot of European cinematographers do come through and work in America. You know, Laz- Laszlo Kovacs famously. You know, <laughs> Polish cinematographers over the years and decades. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a, an appreciation of an of a objective eye um, to the American culture. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. It's uh, unless they want. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. Maybe that was the reason why Ryan and everyone wanted to bring me bring an outsider in mm-hmm. to his projects because they'll have a fresh take on what was effectively a, a kind of a a major television event. You know, Versace, and of course, before that, he did OJ. Yeah. And so, and of course the impeachment. And so a British cinematographer shooting an American story is probably a choice. Yeah. You know, I, and I, I appreciated it. And I, I guess I do have an objective point of view. I, I, um, I came in, you know, I didn't come in trying to simulate what I thought would be uh, like you're saying, you know, the biggest light through the biggest window. It's, yeah. it's uh, to me, to me, you get over that very quickly when you're a cinematographer. It's, yeah. it's only so far you can go with that. And I call it the showreel technique. It's it's all just stuff you want to put on your showreel. And I don't think that is doing any due do- justice to a to a to a major compelling story, you know. 
Now you, you sort of, you talked about, you know, uh, people from Poland and what have you coming over and having a particular perspective, but do you think because of things like globalization and the internet sort of bringing us all together, that sort of shifting to, you know, like I can go on Netflix or Hulu and basically see Korean film now and yeah. watch Korean cinema. And um, it feels like almost, whereas before you had to go to a festival to see right. those, right? Yeah. Do you think, do you think that that's having some kind of impact in the way we perceive our own creation of films? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Because I, I, I went to a film school and I studied all forms of um, entertainment, as it were, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's a really healthy thing that the, the, the floodgates have been opened to a degree mm-hmm. in the sense of accessibility. You know, m- back in my day with film school, the accessibility was trying to find that VHS copy of that movie. Uh, I still remember that my our film tutor had this private little <clears throat> store cupboard with like hundreds of VHS tapes and they were just mm-hmm. the most, it's, you know, some of them weren't even labeled. So you kind of like were just, exp- you, were, you were sort of um, discovering so many different things. And I think it's really healthy to kind of keep, keep that, uh, the access to anything like that on streaming or whatever it is you want to find it um, really healthy. And, yeah. and, and can open your mind um, to different places. There it makes me think, because there's a guy here, because I'm in Toronto, Canada, mm. and there's a guy here. Oh, well, that's where I'm going next. Oh, really? Yeah, I, don't think he, I don't think he does it anymore. But um, back when I was studying film, he basically would, he turned his basement into a, a cinema. Mm. And you would go to his house and pay like a dollar, and he would show you really hard to get films shows movies whatever you know from around the world and it was sort of this weird underground (laughs) you know yeah like you're never going to see this anywhere else coming right and and that that was more like the underground club you know like the way that they would do um i think was in in london they would do a um it would be a movie screening so you pay for the ticket you have no idea what you're watching so you go to this private event you're given a private address probably an underground space and you sit yeah. with complete strangers and watch whatever it is they show you. Um, I love that. But yeah, yeah. Like you say, like back, back in the day, it was almost like you, you have to know the right person to go to the right, you know, exactly bunker to watch the right project or movie. But um, now it, it's, um, you know, if you can't find it, you can find it. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you can track things down. Um yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've on my TV here. I have obviously, you know, Amazon and Netflix, but I also got the Criterion Channel. Yeah, same. Yeah. Which is a uh, an amazing resource of of, of cinema, yeah. <clears throat> whether it be art house or just diverse cinema or just you know uh, old movies from the forties. Um, it's it's healthy. I. I, I I find when I work on any project, I really try to cap any references to pre eighty if I can. You know, I oh just really? Don't think it's, yeah, I just don't think it's healthy to um, to go to. I don't know. I I just find that when you learn about postmodernism at film school, which is one of the first things they teach you, is you know, cultural. You I mean cinema can and television can eat itself. Yeah. Death. Yeah. You know, it's just it just becomes too referential. So. Um, I think somebody asked me last week whether there's still room for um, new and originality. I think there is. I just think that there's, um, it's just a case of um, uh, power, you know, mm-hmm. people like David Fincher or, you know, filmmakers that seemingly have a, uh, you know, they don't have any, um, what's it called? They're final, they have final cut and they have full control. Yeah. To a degree, and um, I, you know that those are the voices that are out there, kind of making what they think they should want to make. Um, but what what's the old saying? There's always like there's only five stories you can tell. Yeah, so it's like that's what I always hear. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's I think it's not the story you tell; it's how you tell the story um, that's interesting. And I'm, I guess, then there was a period actually, as everyone knows, when we came through to the dog, you know, the, remember the dogma period. 
where yeah. we all thought cinema was going to be completely handheld and shot in handy cams, you know, yeah. uh, and not just handheld, but completely raw and available. And for a couple of years, you know, in the same way that um, the French new wave and all that kind of stuff is it, that was the new wave. It was the digital mm-hmm. new wave. And, and I think it was an exciting time, but I, I was, it was kind of nice to see that it settled back down to becoming digital formats that were getting more and more filmic. And we were coming back up into a, a state where we were just telling good, compelling stories. Not to say that, you know, dogma doesn't have a place in life. It's just, you can't, um, mm-hmm. actually, I don't know whether it was ever true, but it was an exciting moment where everyone was hearing that Steven Spielberg was going to direct the dogma movie. And I, and I just thought, <laughs> I just thought if that ever happened, that, that would be the, that would be the turning point. Yeah. The tipping point of, um, going into a new, new yeah. zone of filmmaking. It's one of two things. It either jumps the shark and nobody wants to right. do it anymore yeah. or it becomes the next big thing. Now, I have one last question for you. Um, you know, we've been stuck in this pandemic for quite a while. Uh, and depending on where you are in the world, you're you know stuck at home or you're mm-hmm. able to go out. For those who are stuck at home, is there a show or a movie you've discovered on streaming set networks that people should well, check out? Yeah, I, I, I find settling down and watching movies or streaming or, or bulk of, you know, um, television uh binging i guess you guys call it uh but what i do is my downtime between projects is is try and you know catch up on documentaries so there was there was actually two that i i would love to mention which is um the john wayne gacy uh case which they made into a really compelling i believe it could be netflix Mm -hmm. uh john wayne gacy the serial killer uh i'm fascinated with anything to do with true crime and yeah. true stories. Um, so that was really compelling. <clears throat> and equally so was, uh, actually there was three, there was three, there's like a trilogy. There was there was the Marilyn Monroe uh, documentary of this Irish um, journalist who had been recording uh, t- 20 years worth of interviews, uh, trying wow. to get to the bottom of the conspiracy, wh- whether she was murdered or not. And uh I'm not going to give anything away, so you should watch that. And then the other one was the um, uh, the Andy Warhol diaries, which again, oh, yeah. really compelling. You know, it's sort of stories you know, but the the fact that now the documentaries I find are really getting compelling and cinematic as well. One of my favorites actually is The Imposter, which is probably a good ten years old now. Yeah. But The Imposter is an insane story about a French kid who assumes the identity of an American kid, mm-hmm. and uh, they were doing these well they were doing what you call the recreations of the moment and it was so cinematic i think it was eric wilson actually who's british cinematographer shot it and i remember watching that going oh my god this is getting really great because you know how the documentaries back in the day were a bit cheesy when they cut yeah these really kind of cheesy recreations of the uh the uh the cops interviewing them in the, in yeah. the interview room and all that and, <laughs> Uh, so now I think um, documentaries are getting really, uh, there's so many that I, I love that I could quote, but those three, I would say, uh, are, are really compelling. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. Oh, no, you're welcome. Any, anytime. And, yeah. And, and that's it for this week, guys. Make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses. And of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.